Welcome back to React Native Radio Podcast. Brought to you by the Giraffical Interchange Format. Giraffical Interchange Format, the best way to avoid work. Episode 230, We React to News. I made a mistake, Robin. Okay, you can elaborate? What What it? What did you do? Well, I make lots of mistakes, so I can understand why you'd want <laughs> me to <believable>. elaborate. <laughs> uh, it's very believable. I tweeted, well, first off, that sounds like a mistake, just straight off. I tweeted, but I tweeted, <laughs> should I write an article, Flutter is better than React Native in all the ways that don't matter? And it was kind of like a throwaway joke. I've said this, I've said this many times on the podcast. It's like you've said that on areas. the podcast. So Yeah, I've said it plenty of places. It's your little quip. It's your, your quippy. Yeah, I know. It just gets people going. I, I love it. It's kind of clickbaity right now there's uh there's almost 600 likes on it and people are telling me i need 600 600 it was at like 150 when i saw it yesterday i know so i guess that means i have to write it you have to do it i mean you just said yourself it's clickbaity so it's so clickbaity i'm i'm working on it uh, by the time this comes out it's probably going to be out so maybe we can link to it or you can search for it flutter is better than react native in all the ways that don't matter well now you'll actually have all of the the information to back up that claim because you'll have to do the research to write the blog post. <laughs> Are you saying that I'm making that claim without, <laughs> without information? <laughs> Maybe just like casual information. And now you'll have you'll have casual information. You'll have the con the real concrete, the good stuff. I actually disagree. The reason I disagree <laughs> is because, yes, it's true that I don't have all the information in terms of like really nitty gritty technical details. That is true. You are right about that. But that, those aren't the things that matter. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you'll have to wait for the article to come out. But uh, yeah, I'll, I'll probably be running it by you, Robin, and, uh, and others. I, you know what? The article's probably out. So, uh, you know, like by now, so people can just we'll go. We'll put it in the show it. notes. Yeah. Are you going to build a Flutter app for research purposes? No, because again, that doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. <laughs> doesn't matter. <laughs> it's such an app, <laughs> but it's true. Uh, the, the, the reasons that React Native are better than Flutter really don't have a lot to do with the technical stuff. Uh, there are some technical reasons that, that Flutter is better, but really it has to do with, um, I'm just going to give it, I'm going to give it away. You can go read the article. It's way more nuanced than this, people. It's way more nuanced than this. Go Please read go it. read the article. Go read it. Yes, this is not, don't, don't quote me on Twitter and say <laughs> this guy is, you know, I don't know. Anyway, the reasons are really more business oriented. And it's, can you hire Dart developers right now who have not done Flutter to go do Flutter? Probably not. Probably not. Not really. Can you hire React and JavaScript developers to go to React Native? Like, all over. Tomorrow. Like, they're, they're everywhere. Now, it's hard to hire anywhere, but it's just, I'm talking relatively speaking. That's, that's one. Um, another is, can you share code between your web team and your, and your mobile team? I don't know. Can you? With Flutter, you're probably not using Flutter on the web. I know you can, but you're, you're probably not. I was like, you're you're just inviting the well actually to say, yes, there actually is a Flutter for web. Yeah. And who uses it? I, I can't name anybody. Exactly. This is unnecessarily aggressive. My 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 <laughs> blog article and I go into more things too, but um my blog article explains in a much more Flutter fans, please don't send us tone. hate mail. Oh, uh, you can send it to me. My email is robin at infinite.red. <laughs> Good thing I have filters on and I don't check my email very often. <laughs> you don't, actually. That's what Slack is for. Okay, let's get started. Uh, I'm Jamin, your host and contrary to all evidence, friendly CTO of Infinite Red. I am joined by my admirable co-host. That is not a word that we've used yet. You're Robin running, Heinz. I, I seriously think we need to make a database of the words so that I can check every time. Make sure you I just search it in Google Drive. It pops up if, uh, like, I see in Google Drive, like, in our show notes, it pops up if I've ever used so you it. Work harder, not smarter. Or something like that. I mean, no. Work smarter, not harder? Hmm. This is why you're admirable. <laughs> uh, Mazen is not here today. He is on baby watch. That doesn't mean he's watching a baby. He's watching for a baby to appear. Well, by the time this comes out, he probably will be watching a baby. That's true. 
That is actually very true. He's probably on baby watch right now as he's listening to this. A different type of baby watch. Hi, Mazen. Hi, Mazen's baby. Yeah, Mazen Jr. Actually, is it a boy or a girl? I don't actually don't know. We, we're not supposed to reveal that, probably, on the probably. podcast. We'll let know. him. We'll let him. I don't actually know. So, uh, Robin is a senior software engineer at Infinite Red, is located in Portland, Oregon, and specializes in React Native. This episode is sponsored by Infinite Red. Infinite Red is a premier React Native design and development agency. We don't do Flutter. Located fully remote in the U.S. and Canada. If you're looking for React Native expertise, not Flutter. For your next <laughs> React Native project, not Flutter. Hit us up. You can learn more on our website, <laughs> infinite.red slash React Native. See, this is why you shouldn't skip the uh, the sponsored by. You can learn more on our website, <laughs> infinite.red slash Flutter. I mean, React Native. And don't forget to mention that you heard about us through the React Native radio okay, podcast. Okay, now we really need to add a page to our website. Slash infinite Flutter. Slash Flutter. Yeah, that okay. just tells you to use React Native. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to make a note of that. Uh, yeah. We are hiring. If you are a React Native developer, not a Flutter developer, located in the US <laughs> or Canada, go to careers.infinite.red. Let's see how, how far I can like push this joke before people get really annoyed. I bet they already are. All right. The topic today is We React to News, where we discuss the latest news in the React Native community and get the reactions from our hosts, which of course is just me and Robin today. Not the Flutter community. It's no, just React exactly. Native news. Yeah, we don't really care about the Flutter community's reactions. <laughs> Before we start, I should mention that I get a lot of my React Native news from Sebastian Lorber. So go sign up for his newsletter, This Week in React. This is not a paid endorsement. I just really like his newsletter. He's a great guy, a friend of Infinite Red. So go search for This Week in React, Sebastian Lorber, fantastic stuff. He also posts his newsletters in our community, community community.infinite.red, so you can go check that out. That is about React as well, so if you just want React Native news, go to our very own reactnativenewsletter.com. Over 15,000 subscribers. Actually, I think it's just under 15,000 subscribers. I don't know why I wrote over. It's just under. It's like 14,600 or something. And uh, John Major, who is a uh, co-host on the program sometimes, he's a very busy guy, so not always on here. He has been doing a great job with it. So go check that out. Derek Greenberg, who is our guest coordinator on the program, is also helping with that. And he's doing a great job. Yeah, he's been making videos, which is really, really cool. Yeah, go check those out. They're really cool. So the first three things on our list are all about the new architecture. Now, Jamin, what's the new? What do you mean by the new architecture? (laughs) Thanks for (laughs) queuing me up. Uh, Go to React Native Radio episode 222 with Kevin Gozali from the Facebook uh, sorry, Meta, whatever, React Native core team. And go listen to that if you haven't yet. It's fantastic. And he does a good job of explaining what the re- new architecture is and sort of like how they're rolling it out, which leads us to the first thing, which is the React Native 0.68 pre-release. We're going to have a whole episode about 0.68. So we're not going to go deep into it right now, but what's important to know about this pre-release? Uh, <laughs> I couldn't tell you. <laughs> Don't put that in. Todd's going to. What you're supposed to say is you can now enable the new architecture with a flag. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. You can now enable the new architecture with a flag? Yeah. Yeah, you can. Now, is that the whole new architecture or just like certain pieces of it? I guess what's in there. Yeah. Yeah. What's in there right now? Obviously, there's more coming, but a fair amount of it's ready. Like it's it's in there. It's It's ready to be used. It's not documented super well, uh, but there will be things coming for documentation for sure. There's a lot of uh, behind the scenes stuff happening with the core group that, uh, you know, I don't know how much I'm supposed to say, but like in the release group uh, meetings, um, we've been talking a lot about what, for example, what third party libraries are working well with the new architecture and which ones still need work on them. For example, React Native Screens has a certain thing with it. That needs to be fixed, but it is supporting Fabric, uh, which is, of course, one piece of the new architecture. So, yeah, uh, work is happening. And, of course, now it is available for pre-release. Go check it out, especially if you don't have, like, some super mission-critical thing. Go in there, enable it, see what crashes, see what happens. I've heard that the the core team is really trying to get more people testing the nightly releases Mm -hmm. to sort of suss out any bugs before the releases go live. So if you have the capacity bandwidth to do that uh maybe think about 
installing some nightly releases and filing some bugs. If you have the fortitude. The fortitude. <laughs> the sisu, to use a Finnish word. That is uh, that's definitely something. And we're going to probably work with them to test Ignite on uh, nightlies as well. Uh, so that's a whole thing that, that Gant Laborde and I are working on right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like an exciting uh, inflection point for, for the React Native community as a whole to go to the new architecture. And hopefully from here on out, we have... Uh, well, I, I hate to bring this up again, but it is actually something that was a legitimate criticism of React Native versus Flutter, which was the bridge. Yeah. And this addresses that. So kind of a big, big deal. Our second thing also has to do with the, the new architecture. And it is a work group that's been established, uh, which is... React Native new architecture. Yeah. React Native new architecture under the working, React WG working, working group. group. Yeah. yeah. And that's on GitHub. And it, the about just says work group for the new React Native architecture. It's a discussion only repository to coordinate and support the rollout of the new React Native new architecture. You can access the working group via the discussions tab. And it's a space where the community can meet and discuss the new architecture, fabric, renderer, and the turbo module system, and also code gen, which they don't mention here, but is part of that as well. So uh, there's a lot of stuff going on. There's announcements, deep diving, documentation, libraries, Q&A, releases. Um, and uh, Robin, you're a part of that actually, right? Yeah just got an invitation a couple days ago. Um, it is a closed, technically a closed group by default, but it's open to anybody. You just have to fill out uh, a form and they'll mm -hmm. review it and admit you. But only if you're co as cool as Robin, because uh, <laughs> they haven't accepted me yet. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what their criteria is. <laughs> I think it's just to weed out like intent. Yes, I would. Yeah, and I think there's some value in that for sure. Um, I have plenty on my plate with being involved with releases and things like that. But yeah, this is, uh, it's a fantastic new, and this is uh, actually one of the coolest things about what the React Native core team is doing. They're involving the community a lot more uh, intensely with, with this rollout. And do go, talk, or go, do go listen to React Native Radio 222 because uh, Kevin talks more about that. I should actually go listen to that myself. I don't think I was here for that. Oh, man, it's great, Robin. Yeah, it was fantastic. The only thing that was missing was you. Oh. But, uh, but that's okay. We, we did as well as we could. React Native Screens, that's our third thing here. It supports Fabric. Uh, Software Mansion's been doing some fantastic work over there. And they are introducing Fabric to React Native Screens. And, and this is something that they, they do have a blog article up about that on the Software Mansion blog. And it allows you to flip the switch and turn on Fabric and allows you to then play around with React Native Screens and Fabric. Why is React Native Screens using Fabric. Why is that an important thing, Robin? Um, because React Native Screens interfaces with the native navigation system. Exactly. I, I totally, I didn't prep you for that at all. I just threw you under the bus and you totally <laughs> fielded it well. That was great. Uh, yeah, no, that's, that's exactly right. It's uh, React Native Screens is one of my favorite libraries out there. And I love the fact that it interfaces with the native side of things and allows you to, to uh, I guess, write native navigation using JavaScript. Gives you a more native feel yeah so that you said that that is a flag it's not so yes. you only turn on fabric if you're using fabric in react native if you want to use it yeah oh uh, well, that's awesome beyond the new architecture now and get reactions about typescript yeah typescript 4.6 what are your reactions to the new release of 4.6 i probably wouldn't have known about it if i wasn't looking for news but reading, just reading through the change, like... Kind of under the radar. Yeah. Well, it's... I mean, at this point, TypeScript is so established that mm -hmm. the changes are really very incremental and a lot of times very niche. Mm -hmm. But just reading through the change log, there's some cool stuff. You can call code before you call super in a class constructor, as long as it doesn't refer to this. Yeah. So they're getting a little bit less strict. Which makes sense because sometimes you can call stuff that doesn't that, like accessing this, the, the word this, the, the keyword this or the whatever before super in a constructor is a problem because the constructor needs to set some things up using super. Right. But previously, in order to prevent that, they just blanket prevented you from running anything yeah. before running super because that's the I mean, I think that's the way JavaScript does it. And so TypeScript did the same but now they're a little bit more yeah clever about it so they they'll check to make sure you're not not actually referencing this and if you're not then mm -hmm. cool you can run whatever you want i can imagine this would be useful for debugging like if you run a console log <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't reference this and you need to run it you know but the the real question is who's still using 
classes. I guess people who don't I use React. Agree. <laughs> I agree. Actually, there are probably quite a few people in the audience who are like, hey, I'm still using class components. I forget there's people that uh, write JavaScript and TypeScript that aren't doing mm -hmm. React and React Native. I feel like JavaScript classes were kind of a mistake, but I understand why they added them. It was like everybody wanted that. I may have wanted it back in the day. I don't know. Wait, wait. Are you saying they were they were not original to the language? No, they weren't. So uh, JavaScript, when it first came out, was more... In, for quite some time was more, it was like prototypical inheritance was the way that it was kind of like designed. It was not designed with class hierarchy uh, inheritance. And it still works that way under the under the, the hood. Like classes are not like your cl classical uh, classes. <laughs> they are, they are a, uh, just sort of like a, a sugar on top of the prototypical inheritance that, that JavaScript uses. They look kind of familiar, but if you, if you really think about how they work, they, they're not the same. As, as, you know, like Ruby or Python or something like that. It gives, it's the illusion of a class. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it still uses the, the prototypes under the hood. I still think that like one of JavaScript's like strengths is that you can just kind of like blast out this object literal and then hang things off of it and, you know, <laughs> sort of do whatever you want with it. And TypeScript really embraces that because you can apply a type or an, or a, an interface to any object. It doesn't have to be defined as a class huh. but inheritance is something that i really avoid as much as possible anyway uh these days it's more like compose things as much as possible and, and javascript was very much built that way from the beginning yeah it's funny because i didn't i didn't learn javascript mm -hmm. until i was learning react native and so yeah. i I've, I've never really used javascript outside of the react ecosystem you literally start with like es 2015 yeah like that was your in initial JavaScript. Yeah. So my context for what JavaScript was mm -hmm. originally is minimal. Um, is, do we have time for like an old timey story? Absolutely. We have time. <laughs> my first real time using JavaScript, I don't know the year, but it was a long time ago, probably 2000, early 2000s. And uh, there's some there's some gray beards in the audience who are like, oh, you rookie, you know, <laughs> but but that's, uh, you know, I was doing other stuff before then. And I needed I was building a website and I needed this was just for like a friend and I needed a, he wanted a drop down menu, you know, where you hover over the menu. These used to be w really popular, but they're much less popular now where you hover over a menu and it drops down a, you know, a list of things to do. Just a hover, not a click. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You couldn't do that with CSS back in those days. Um, it just you just couldn't do that. Like it, there wasn't a way to do that, so you had to use JavaScript. So I just searched and I found something probably on either Stack Overflow or probably before Stack Overflow. It was probably Experts Exchange or one of those other like pre Stack Overflow proto Stack Overflows back in the day. <laughs> and I copied and pasted a bunch of code into my <laughs> into my website. Don't do this. And I just edited a couple of things and it worked. It honestly worked. They literally have warnings in the JavaScript console now on like big websites. Like if you go to Facebook yeah. and you open the console, it's like, don't paste stuff here. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Uh, so like this was just naive and I, it was some sort of a very popular drop down, which was horribly written. Like when I looked at it as a programmer, even back then, I was like, this doesn't seem right, but I've never done this language. So maybe it is now looking back I'm like, wow, that was terrible. But uh, yeah, I, I managed to, to make that happen. And it was like very Java-esque written JavaScript. So yeah, uh, that's that's the first time I used JavaScript and I had no idea what it was doing. I just dropped it in and went with it. What year was that? I really, I think it was early 2000. I just don't, I don't remember exactly. It would have been sometime back then. Now, see, I started coding in 2014 mm -hmm. and I was doing Ruby. 2014. I started in 1992, I think, something like that. But it was QBasic and I didn't really get beyond QBasic for a long time. Anyway, we are way far afield here. I, editors may have to cut some of that out. <laughs> <laughs> or not, you know? It's okay. It's just, a, it's a casual episode. Kind of is. Uh, so let's see. Further down in the TypeScript, in the new TypeScript release, a control flow analysis for destructured discriminated unions. So I think this, this is around inferred types. Mm -hmm. So if you have 
I don't know. I mean, it's going to be hard to explain this. This is one of those edge cases you're talking about. Like, yeah, yeah, this is not something you generally run into. I just noticed that there were a lot of control flow things, mm-hmm. not just in this release, but in the previous one as well. They must be really working on that. Right. It's sort of like gates as you're working where it's like, hey, I recognize that if the value of this property is this, then mm. this other property has to be this just based on what the data looks like. It kind of reminds me of Sudoku. Yeah. It, you've, you've played Sudoku. Oh, like, yeah. Like you're like, if this is over here, then this other one must be something else. You know, it's funny you brought up Sudoku because I just this week started playing a new uh, iPhone game called Nonogram. Okay. Which reminds me a lot of Sudoku. Okay. It's similar. It's more it's more like visual, but it's a lot of that sort of deduction like okay, well if if this is here, then that means this has mm-hmm. to be at least covering this much. Like it's yeah, very very. Do you think that if you are attracted to those types of games that something like TypeScript is also kind of hits those same <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Like endorphins or something. <laughs> I think probably. <laughs> dopamine (laughs) get your dopamine where you can yeah use typescript there's also uh some recursion depth checks around generics and properties they improve that um if you know what that means then you'll be excited if you don't then whatever uh (laughs) js doc improvements i'm actually kind of excited about that and everybody's like who uses js js doc but i was actually building uh i'm still building a like a a role-playing game with my brother's and since they're not TypeScript experts, I thought, well, I'll just write it in JavaScript. We don't even have like a package or a compiler or any of that. There's no build pipeline whatsoever. We literally just run the code that we write, which is weird these days. <laughs> um, and I'm using JS doc to provide types. And it's actually pretty cool. I actually like JS doc a lot. It's pretty cool. So JS doc is part of TypeScript? J- uh, TypeScript understands JS doc oh, okay. and will then type check against it. Oh, okay. So I gotcha. You I was like, why wouldn't something? they call it TS doc? But it is. Right. It's a JavaScript <laughs> thing and TypeScript is smart about reading it. Yeah. It's a .js. It's a .js file. It's not .ts. And, but then you can turn on TypeScript saying check or allow JS. And then it'll go in there and it'll look through and there are these comments and it'll be like, uh, this you know, variable is a string, you know, at type string. And then it will actually then enforce that that's a string and warn just like TypeScript. But there's actually some things that JS doc does that TypeScript can't and will never be able to do according to one of the core members I talked to. Didn't you run across something like that just recently? I did. Yeah. So let me try to explain it really quickly. This is just really another aside in an episode full of asides. Uh, I guess it is. We're reacting, right? This is my reaction. Our genuine reaction. So let's say that you create an object literal, you know, with the curlies, right? And you're just like const jmon equals curly. And then maybe you have like a name, which is a string. And you have an age, which is an integer or a number, I guess. And uh, maybe you have something else that's like children. And then it, that would might have might be an array. And then in the array, then you would want maybe additional people, you know, like like or some some data, right? Well, how do you type just one property of that? Like you could you could literally write that out and have TypeScript infer what the types are, which is great. But what if you want to enforce that age is always a number, not just infer it. But just age. Yeah, just age. Right. Not name. You want it to infer that name is a string, but. Exactly. Like infer whatever name is. Assert that age is a number and let it infer the rest. You can't do that in TypeScript. Mm hmm. And if you say as number, then that coerces, which is not quite what you want. Right. Because you lose you lose your type checking because it's just right. it's saying whatever I give you for this, it's a number. Pretend you, like it's you a can, number. You can just don't look. It's a number, I swear. It's a number, I swear. <laughs> exactly. Which will then type the object properly, but then you're not actually checking that what you pass in. Right. You could put a, you could put a string in there and then type would still be happy. Exactly. As number. So... JS doc lets you just put the type right above the property and it will enforce that it's a number and infer that it's a number at the same time. Like it will actually then say this is a number. So that is something that TypeScript doesn't do, uh, which came in really handy when I, we were creating this, this game because I didn't want to have to type every object out. Sometimes I just want to infer what they are and move on, you know, and uh, that's because then I could do like type uh, character equals type of, you know, my character type of is really nice for that. That's good to know. 
I think I, I mostly have used JS doc for just literally documenting like this is what this component does and mm -hmm. these are the props that you can pass. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Now, even if allow JS isn't on now with the newest version of TypeScript, you can get suggestions and checks um, now. So that's that's kind of cool. Just in your editor. So that's cool. Plenty more in the announcement. Go check that out. We'll put it in the show notes. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about Flipper. Flipper. Flipper will be available. Flipper. We need to do a whole episode on Flipper, by the we way. We should. I've just started really using Flipper more. Mm -hmm. So I think it'd be interesting to talk about what all it can do. You were doing some performance stuff. Yeah. Looking at some flame graphs, which will fun. explain what a flame graph is in a future episode of React Native Radio. <laughs> Stay tuned. Uh, it will be available for web and Node.js apps now, not just for mobile apps. Oh, nice. So they announced that um, last month. That's very cool. Uh, Any reactions to that? Um, so previously you could only use like React Dev Tools or mm -hmm. similar, and now you have the entirety of Flipper and its suite of plugins and tools. Yeah, that's great. I wonder if web developers will use this or if it's more like React Native developers who just don't want to switch tools. I would guess more of the latter. I think web developers are pretty set up with tools already. Um, but this is a nice, mm -hmm. like, let's, if, especially since you're seeing a lot more cross-platform, monorepo, like, web and native uh, type of projects that start with React Native developers building web rather than the other way around. Um, this is a way for React Native developers to keep using their preferred tools. Speaking of monorepos, thanks for that. Uh, that brings us to our next set one. Set you right, <laughs> right up on a pedestal there. Set you right up. <laughs> exactly. I can just <laughs> up on a T. I can hit it. Ignite 7.9 and 7.10, which is out now, but that's, that's a smaller release. 7.9 specifically supports PNPM and monorepos because now it supports symlinks, as long as you don't use Expo. If you use Expo, then sorry, you're on your own. But if you are using Ignite directly without passing in the dash dash Expo flag, it will automatically come with symlink support, which allows you to use PNPM instead of Yarn because that uses symlinks much faster than Yarn. And uh, I kind of like it, but also it's not as standard. So you may run into some edge cases and stuff. Uh, but we actually did quite a bit of work to make Ignite work with that. And that also is very helpful if you're doing a monorepo like um, NX or um, Lerna or any of those other options out there. I have publicly been kind of mm -hmm. anti. I wish I wish it had been around. I wish it had been around when we were building a monorepo and we're fighting against Metro. Exactly. Now, some of this actually came, uh, we actually used one of the tools from RNX kit, which we just talked about in React Native Radio 227 with Tommy Nguyen and Adam Foxman, uh, Better React Native Tooling. They're working on RNX kit and part of that is the Simlink support. So check out r and 227 to hear more about that. Uh, but Ignite 7.9 now has, has uh, support for Simlinks and uh, more coming as well. But that's, uh, that's kind of the big one right now. Fun fact, at least three of the most recent Ignite releases are uh, courtesy of yours truly and not in a good way. <laughs> I kept having to fix... <laughs> you should have just stopped there. I like kept... You should have just taken credit. <laughs> I should have. I kept having to <laughs> fix stuff that I broke. So That's how I inflate my commit count as well. <laughs> revert, revert. I, it was totally a, an understandable pro problem. Uh, I've done it many times myself. <laughs> Uh, so the last thing we have here is called glass morphism. What's that, Ruffin? Um, So you want the, the wrong answers only? Sure. Because <laughs> it sounds like, I don't know, it's, no, never mind. I don't have anything. I <laughs> thought there was going to be something funny there. This what just didn't materialize. There has to be. It sounds like transfiguration. It's like, oh. like what wizards learn how to do in order to like make glass chain shape i don't know you're right <laughs> yeah there there is something there i don't know what i'm not smart enough to figure gant's gonna be he's gonna be listening to this episode and he'll have some hilarious joke <laughs> in his mind so everybody in the audience just just imagine gant making a funny joke and laugh and then we'll move on sounds good <laughs> but really what is glass morphism uh like like what are we, what are we talking about here uh as far as i know it's a it's a cool little like 
UI style that looks like uh, like a pane of like frosted glass mm-hmm. uh, moving over over, over top, top of, of something. something. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty cool. And that's uh, React Native Skia, right? React Native Skia is library by Shopify, right? Mm-hmm. And it implements the Skia the Skia graphics library, which I didn't know a ton about until reading up for this. Mm-hmm. But it's it powers a lot. Of, it's the the graphics engine behind Chrome, Chrome OS, Flutter. Mm. Mm-hmm relevant mm. <laughs> Flutter, firefox so it's a pretty big deal it's, it's a very cool library there's a lot of power there you can now uh create a glass morphism in react native mm-hmm. using react native skia we're definitely going to be doing an episode about react native skia maybe we'll have some of the maintainers on or something like that and uh, talk more about it and see what's going on there we i do also have some plans on react native live little shout out for react native live go to rn.live which is my Twitch stream. It's very fun. Go check that out because I am going to also have one of the maintainers on there as well in one of these days. So go check that out. I love hanging out, listening and watching React Native Life. I'll put it on the background. I appreciate that. I don't always uh, enter the chat. Sometimes I do. Mm -hmm. If I'm working on something else, I sometimes don't. But I just like to have it on because it's, I don't know, it's just watching you do open source a lot or talking to somebody. It's casual. It's not. Yeah, it's super casual. Yeah, we don't, there's not like, I basically my philosophy there is if it's, if I, if I have to prepare too much for it, then it's too much work and I'm not going to do it. Well, you're doing it twice a week. You can't like be giving. Exactly. uh, Basically conference talk twice a week. It's like three hours, twice a week, six hours. And I'm not going to prep for that. Like the prep is in the stream. (laughs) Literally, that's part of this. Like that's part of the stream. That's part of the stream. That's the whole point. What are we talking about? Uh, How do I get to, okay. You know, it's a lot of that, but it's, it's fun. I love it. It's so much fun. All right. Well, you know what? This meandering episode, uh, of course, brought to you by Infinite Red. And uh, if you'd like to nerd more about nerd out more about react native check out of course my my twitch stream you can also go to youtube.infinite.red and see the same stream you can join our slack community community community.infinite.red we have almost 2000 i think it's 1992 or something like that react native developers in the react native channel in there plus a lot more in other channels but it's primarily a react native community where can people find you to complain about your take on Flutter, Robin? I will be staying far away from Flutter, but you can find me on Twitter at Robin underscore Hines. And you can find me at Jamin Holmgren. You can find our Twitter for the show at React Native RDIO. As always, thanks to our producer and editor, Todd Wirth, our assistant editor and episode release coordinator, Jed Bartoski, our social media coordinator, Missy Warren, our designer, Justin Husky, and our guest coordinator, Derek Greenberg. All those people work at Infinite Red and have other jobs, by the way. They're taking time out of their busy days to produce this episode, and we really, really appreciate it. Thanks to our sponsor, Infinite Red. Check us out at infinite.red slash react native. Thanks to you listening today. Make sure to subscribe. Make sure to send this to a friend who loves Flutter or doesn't. Either way, I, this isn't even about Flutter. I don't know why I'm saying that. Uh, reminder that Infinite Red is hiring React Native engineers. If you're a senior level React Native engineer located in the U.S. or Canada, go to careers.infinite.red. We'll see you all next time. <laughs>